Welcome. Um, welcome to our talk today that's uh, brought to you by the McCormick Office of Personal Development. I'm Joe Holtgrieve. I direct that office and I'm a dean in the undergraduate engineering office. And I'm thrilled to be welcoming Jeremy Hunter here today. I, I first saw Jeremy speak last year at a conference on mindfulness and technology. And he did an amazing job of describing the plight of the knowledge worker and, uh, and how difficult it is to focus our attention and how important the quality of our attention is to our lives and our success. And, and I thought about the McCormick Office of Personal Development and our goal, our mission, which is to help our students explore themselves through self-awareness, explore opportunities they have to get engaged, to facilitate their engagement in those activities, and then hopefully help them transform through reflecting on those experiences. And I thought this is a natural fit for the work that Jeremy does and, um, and for his, uh, his personal area of expertise. Um, Jeremy may have an opportunity to share a very compelling personal story of his. Uh, uh, it was uh, a part of his introduction at this conference, and uh, it culminated with uh, the, the fact that I think it was probably 13 of his students had volunteered to donate an organ uh, to save his life. And I thought, I need to bring Jeremy to campus to send the message that if I ever have a life-threatening disease, <laughs> I expect all of my former students to donate organs. So that's why he's really here. <laughs> I teach at the Drucker School of Management, and uh, about 12 years ago, I developed a curriculum to help managers manage themselves. The fact that there's an office of personal development at a school of engineering is really fantastic. In fact, I, I wrote one of my friends today who's the director of the Dalai Lama Fellows Program, which is a social entrepreneurship program in, located in the Bay Area. And I said, you know, can you believe there's a, an office of personal development at the School of Engineering? And, and I said, times are really changing. And so McCormick is really on the cutting edge of, of where things are in the world. And, and it's, it's a great thing that you can be here. Twelve years ago, when I suggested we uh, teach managers to manage themselves, some people said, well, why, why would we want to do that? And we, you know, we might teach finance, but we don't teach personal finance. So what, you know, we don't teach you how to balance your checkbook. So why would we teach you to manage yourself? And in the intervening years, especially with the help of financial crises and things like that, you know, it becomes really clear why managing what's happening inside you when you have no control of what's happening outside you is really important. So I guess the, the question I have for you is, you know, what makes you successful in the long run? And as Joe mentioned, I, when I was 20, maybe a little bit older than some of you are here today, I, I was diagnosed with a, with a, term, a supposedly terminal incurable illness. And, uh, and I had to figure out a different way to live. And so things like mindfulness and meditation and all of that sort of thing were, were really not on the radar screen. And I had to, to learn, uh, kind of on my own, kind of groping around in the dark, how, how to do that. And uh, so after we, uh, my lab moved from the University of Chicago to uh, uh, the Drucker School of Management, and I'm sure that you probably know that Peter Drucker is considered to be the, the founding father of the discipline of management. And when we hear the words management, we tend to think business management. But what he was really concerned with was how do you create a society that functions? And one of the core ideas that he, he worked with was this idea you can't manage anything else unless you manage yourself first. Right? And so it struck me that we didn't really have, that we could teach people systematic ways of you know, managing finances or you know, all the things that you do, managing material, proper, material you know, substances and transforming them and doing all kinds of amazing stuff. But you know, how to manage your anger, how to manage your attention, how to not get angry in traffic, you know, these kind of things uh, uh, kind of a mystery. Right? Or it was assumed you could do them. 
I think that's an assumption that's not necessarily uh, warranted anymore. And there's some interesting research that's come out. This is uh, by someone named Jean Twenge, who now teaches at uh, San Diego. Uh, her core finding, she studied rates of, of uh, childhood anxiety and found that the, the amount of anxiety that an average American experienced in the 1980s, American child, was equivalent to the amount of anxiety a child psychiatric patient experienced in the 1950s. Right? That kind of blew my mind. And this is, these are kids in the 1980s, right? So now we're 20, 30 years on. Can we, can we imagine that this has gotten better? Right. So another data, another data point in this kind of interesting world of self-management. Uh, this is a great book. So, so it's easy to kind of pick on the internet as uh, the, the thing which is destroying civilization. And there's a, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of a center. There's a, uh, uh, you know, it's controversial what, what's, what's actually happening. There's some uh, data which suggests that internet uh, you know, switching back and forth, and this is something we talked about at lunch, is really kind of undermining our ability to concentrate. And so the ability to sustain attention over the long run seems to be eroding. And there's data that suggests that's true. There's other data that suggests that the opposite, that the internet is making us more intelligent by being able to, to interlink and have conversations with people in a way that, that uh, uh, wasn't possible before. So this is kind of up for grabs. But I, I think any of us would certainly suggest that, oh, my ability to pay attention is not what it used to be. And then another, a final thing, uh, work done at UCLA, finding that people who uh, you know, deal with a lot of information, that information overload uh, leads to further degrading the ability to process information. So we're, here we are in a knowledge work society where information is the thing that we work with, and there's so much of it that our brains can't handle it. So how are we going to do that? You know, how are we going to manage that? I'm sure that one response might be in incorporating some kind of chip inside your head. And so, so it will, you know, we'll just get an implant and we can process the information in a different way. I'm sure that will happen. And I'm sure that'll lead to all kinds of social controversies about what it means to be human and, and all of that. That'll, be, that'll happen within our lifetime. Uh, so here we are in this kind of brave new world we've created and our neural infrastructure, our emotional infrastructure, our perceptual infrastructure isn't necessarily equipped to handle it. And so what do we do? And so this is one place where I think the, uh, this notion of learning how to manage ourselves can be, can be important. So in the talks, when I give talks to executive audiences, whether it is in, in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or Stockholm or Tokyo, it's almost always the same sort of picture that gets painted. Um, that there's so much coming at me, I don't know, I don't know how to deal with it. You know? How do we make good decisions? How do we see you know, into the future to, to make uh, uh, wise decisions about the things that we're responsible for? So it's an interesting kind of point of being alive in terms of uh, human history. So if we think about management, you know, the idea is kind of traditional idea of management is managing a team or managing an organization. And you have this idea of managing yourself. And then, well, how do I manage myself? You know, what do I do? I, I got a note from uh, an old colleague of mine the other day in response to the talk I gave um, saying that, you know, I realize my life is totally out of control. And I don't know what to do to change it. So one thing we could consider, a framework to think about, is how do we manage a moment? And that the moment is one way of focusing attention to seeing what's, what's happening right now. And I argue that managing oneself is learning how to manage oneself in the moment. Right? And everything else is abstract. Because it's like, what am I doing right now? Right? Where is my attention right now? What, am I, what is my body experiencing right now? What's the emotional reaction I'm having right now? Right? Because it's only right now that I can change anything. Right? I can't do anything about what happened yesterday, and I can't do anything about what's going to happen tomorrow, and how much of our time is spent in yesterday or in tomorrow. Right? 
you know, how many of us think about, oh, you know, what's going to happen to my job, or how am I going to get a job, or, or oh, the, the exam I got a B plus on, and how is that going to, all right, you've all been there, right? I get a B plus on the exam, what does that mean? I'm going to get a, it means I'm not going to get an A in the, in the course, I don't get an A in the course, that means my score is going to be this, and blah, blah, and then it ends up in some story of you being permanently unemployable, right? You've all gone, we've all gone through that kind of chain of, of, of anxiety and, and thinking. Whereas, you know, your life is happening right now. How come it's so easy for our brain to generate a, whole, a story that inevitably leads to us living under a bridge somewhere with, you know, fingerless gloves burning our hands with, or, you know, warming our hands over a burning barrel, right? Penniless, penniless and unloved. So, so self-management begins with learning how to manage what's going on right now. Right? Three basic categories. Right? What's happening in my body, what's happening emotionally, and what are the internal narratives I'm telling myself? Right? What's the story? So if we think about what our experience is in life, from an internal point of view, it's body sensations, emotions, and stories and narratives. No matter what our external situation might be, right? whether you're eating McDonald's or you're eating prime rib, or you're eating, you know, kale. There's a body sensation, there's emotion, and there's thoughts and stories. That's what your life is. So then if we think about it in terms of a continuity, right, then we've had this continuity of body sensations, emotions, and storylines our whole life. And then at some point it stops, and then you're dead, and then you don't have to worry about anything anymore, right? So, so how do we manage this moment? Okay, so I'm going to show you three different situations. And what I'd like you to do is notice what happens to your body, right? what happens emotionally, and what are the narratives that show up in your head. Okay? So everybody, I imagine, has a difficult person in their life. right? Anybody not have a difficult person in their life? So, think about your difficult person, then your phone rings, and you look down, and it's the difficult person. Right? What happens in your body? <laughs> you're smiling. What happens in your body? What are the emotions you're experiencing? What's the narrative? She's smiling, and you're shaking your head. <laughs> That's great. So what happens in your body? The difficult person shows up on caller ID. What do you notice? Feet started tingling. Tense. Where do you notice the tension? Right here, yeah. Right? Start to scrunch up. Anybody else notice tense when difficult person calls? Right? Maybe you gird your jaw, you might make a fist. Please. Tension around my heart. Oh, what's this going to be? Please. Lose the ability to think straight. Yeah, because it's a difficult person, right? Uh, I, I gave a talk to a group of financial managers, and we said, uh, you know, uh, said, so do you have a difficult client? And there was a guy in the back of the room who said, oh, God, Joan. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so Joan became our kind of, you know, uh, stand-in for difficult person. So what happens emotionally? What happens emotionally when Joan calls? Anger? Frustration. Frustration. Oh, Joe's back. Annoyance, irritation, please, worry, what does she want now, right? Anybody else? So all not good things, and, how, and, and what are the narratives? <laughs> this will not go well, right? Expectation. What am I going to have to do? Yeah. What do they want now? Because Joan is so high maintenance, right? OK, so seeing that, see how this happens, right? Something happens, and then we have a response. Most of the time, something happens, we have a reaction, we take action, but we don't see what happens in the middle. Right? So learning to see what happens in the middle. Oh, I'm getting tense. Oh, I'm angry. I have this whole storyline that, you know, what a pain in the neck this person is. 
it helps us to see what's going on inside ourselves. So like, oh, maybe I don't want to follow this pathway. Maybe I can do something else. Right? So another situation. You have to take a flight for maybe the most important meeting of your career. Maybe it's a job interview. All right? You get to the airport, and the airport's shut down. Right? That never happens in Chicago, right? So what happens in your body? Pit in your stomach. Heart rate goes up. Emotion? Worry. Anything else? Frustration, right, it's shut down again. Right, anything else? Sadness. Joe. Oh, yeah, please. Please. Disbelief. How can this happen, right? Yeah, and then what are the narratives? Maybe we want, maybe like, oh, this always happens to me, or uh, this means uh, I'm going to end up under that bridge, you know, warming my hands over a burning barrel. Right? All of this stuff. The, world, the universe is ex conspiring against me. You know, who knows what the narrative is? So final thing. This is, I'm sure you've all had dreams about this. Right? You're in the dream. You wake up. You look at your calendar. And then, oh my gosh, it's the final you haven't studied for. <laughs> right? And there it is. Right? What happens? Right? Heart races. How am I going to do this? Here I am again. I'm going to fail. Right? So learning to see what happens inside you in the moment is the first step. Right? Uh, learning, watching that reaction. Uh, here's, another, here's another moment. This is when, if, say if you were to take my class, this would be week one. We learn how to manage the spin cycle. Uh, how many of you try to live your life to avoid stress? Okay, now how many of you think there's no way you can live your life trying to avoid stress? Ah, so maybe what we could do is think about how do we meet or develop our capacity to meet stress more effectively, all right? So what is stress? So we've already gotten some great examples of what stress is, right? My, my, uh, my muscles tense, my heart rate goes up, uh, maybe I get angry, I feel frustrated, what else? Sweaty palms. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Panic. Panic, yeah. Anybody else? This is the side of the room that doesn't experience stress. <laughs> it almost shuts down. Say it, it shuts down. down. Yeah, right. So, what is it? What is stress? Right? Basically, it's a reaction that generates an inborn reaction, kind of part of our legacy system, in a way, that creates energy to fight or flee. Uh, and it's a natural reaction that helps us survive. It's protective. It's not a bad thing. Right? And if you didn't have this reaction, you'd have other problems. Right? But instead of you know, tigers chasing us down Lakeshore Boulevard, uh, we got this. So we've developed this incredibly sophisticated, nuanced society with a nervous system that's adapted for a different sort of situation. And so, uh, so we can have survival reactions or stress responses just by words, right? budget cut. Right? Or if you're a uh, uh, you know, cat owner, my wife texted me this morning saying, oh, the, the cat peed on the bed. Right? If any, any, cat, any cat owner knows that the two words cat pee are probably the most unpleasant uh, aspects of owning a little animal, right? So when we answer the question, what does it mean to manage yourself, th this answer will change over time. But the first answer is, how do you start to manage your nervous system? Right? And why I think this is important is that, at least for me, in most of the education I received, I learned how to manage my upper cortex. Right? And the rest of the brain and the rest of the body were kind of just not part of the deal. 
And yet, if we're growing up in a society where the average person feels clinical levels of anxiety, we need to learn how to manage the nervous system. So let's talk about the nervous system. The nervous system is divided into two branches. One is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is like the brake. It calms things down. Your heart rate goes down, your muscles relax, you unclench your jaw, your appetite is stimulated. On the other side, so it's like the brake, okay? It's like slowing things down. On the other side is the sympathetic nervous system. It's like the gas pedal. It brings energy up. Your muscles tense because I might have to defend myself or I might have to escape. I might feel anger. Uh, I start breathing faster. I, I gird my jaw because I'm, I might brace myself for impact. I might make a fist in case I need to attack. Right? These are all non-conscious, immediate, automatic responses. They happen without us wanting to. Right? So Joan calls and suddenly your heart starts racing. She hasn't done anything yet. All she's done is called you. Uh, this one is interesting, conversion of glycogen to glucose. There is a clear relationship between chronic stress and diabetes. Right? And so there, you know, this is kind of over the long run kind of uh, uh, damaging to the body. So you have parasympathetic on one side, the brake, and the sympathetic, the gas pedal, on the other. And, you know, I make the argument stress is all about the gas pedal. Right? That's fairly obvious. Now, let's think about relationship between stress and productivity. For many of us, especially if you're under the age of 30, I think the implicit relationship between stress and productivity is making effort. And I would argue that, I would guess that many of you got to where you are because you have made a heck of a lot of effort. And so, I don't know how many of you were at the lunch, I see a couple familiar faces, but one of the things we talked about is that you know, I make so much effort that maybe uh, it's finals time and I, I don't sleep or, or whatnot, right? So take it from an old guy to, to young people. That will work until you turn about 30. And then suddenly your body doesn't like this anymore, right? The reality is, well, you know, we know what this is, right? So the, you, you may call this effort. You, pull it all out at the end of the semester, and then what happens when you go home? Mumble, mumble? Crash. Crash, right, exactly. So, right, you spend your vacation that you've been looking forward to in the hospital with pneumonia. So, um, so something like this is more representative of, of how it actually is. There's some kind of tipping point, and, you know, stress, some kind of activity makes us... Uh, uh, more active, you know, uh, challenge makes us more activated, but if we just keep pushing it, there's some you know, negative return on your investment, so to speak. Understanding the biological reality of this and learning how to program it into your life in a conscious way is one of the ways you set yourself up for success over the long run. If you were a group of uh, executives, one of the things we would talk about is how do you create a support system for yourself that every successful executive I know has created a support system. Their job is usually to take care of other people, to take care of the organization, and the support system's job is to take care of them. And it isn't necessarily your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, but you know, it could be, in your case, maybe it's a team or sports or something where you have an aspect of your life that's about rest and relaxation. And you need to build that in. That is not extra. So thinking about in a very clear, conscious way, what are your sources of support? Because, let me flip back a couple slides, the name of the game is to be able to recognize, one of the reasons why I started out asking you questions about the body is when does your body, what does your body feel like when it's relaxed? When does your body feel like when it's excited and you're, you're kind of in the flow? And what does your body feel like when you've tipped over to the other side, right? Maybe this is tired, maybe this is exhausted, maybe this is depressed and, I, and don't talk to me, I'm, I'm gonna spend my day in bed, right? What does the body feel like? Because that, 
That's your gauge on your dashboard that tells you what's going on. For me, somebody like me that's fairly dense at, at all these things, I had to learn, and I'm still learning, what does tired feel like? So how do you have a sustained you know, expenditure of energy as opposed to big expenditure of energy then big crash to go along with it? So how do you create balance in your life, that kind of balance in your life? So uh, at the Neural Leadership Institute uh, Summit a couple of years ago, this idea of leadership lockdown syndrome, syndrome was, was presented. One of the authors, I think, is at Notre Dame. What is leadership lockdown syndrome? And it goes back to what we talked about earlier, that the nervous, you know, the leader's nervous system can't process information effectively because their, their nervous system is on high alert. You know, sympathetic arousal is so high, I can't take in new information. So for a knowledge, a knowledge economy or knowledge society, what does it mean that the leader is so overwhelmed, they can't think straight, their memory is bad, they can't make good decisions, their judgment is poor, they're not flexible in terms of how they see things and they're emotionally reactive. That's not really great. So then they further talk about this vicious cycle of not having enough sleep, I'm in a high stress environment, I wake up in a bad mood, I don't get enough sleep, right? and then it keeps going down. I have to tell you that one of my Japanese students many years ago said, that, oh, in my office we have a betting pool for who can sleep at the office the most nights that, the, in the week and who has the biggest ulcer. Right? So it was like you know, they lived in this vortex. So let me, let me take a pause for a second. Comments or questions, thoughts? Anything here sound off base or not part of your world? No, I'll take your grim silence as a, <laughs> as a, as a not a good sign. But uh, so here's how we could think about this. This is one framework I learned uh, about thinking about a zone of resilience. A zone of resilience is the capacity of the nervous system to absorb stimulation. And we all have a zone of resilience. Uh, someone like my wife has a really wide zone of resilience, right? She's like the Mississippi River, like very hard to, very hard to shake her, you know? Then someone like me has a very narrow zone of resilience and, you know, my airplane's delayed by 10 minutes and I'm already freaking out, right? So this is kind of where we like to live, right? This is the self we present, you know, uh, on our job uh, application or our Match.com uh, profile. Uh, this is, you know, the person we like to be. Then let's say there's a little too much stimulation and we move out of resilience and into hyperarousal. This is the sympathetic nervous system activating and we get stuck. So any of this sound familiar? Right? So hard for me to sleep or relax. I got muscular tension, anxiety attack worry, hyperactivity, I feel panicky, somebody mentioned that earlier, enrage, heart rate goes up, somebody mentioned that earlier, I have a short fuse, I'm hypervigilant, you know, hypervigilance is, I have a friend who's a hypervigilant, and um, when we go to a restaurant, he always positions himself so he can see who's coming in and out of the restaurant and where all the exits are, right? His nervous system is so highly activated, he, he it thinks it's constantly under threat. We have racing thoughts, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning and I've got stuff to do and I can't turn it off, right? Worry, chronic pain, something I call the cheeseburger chocolate axis, right? So there's fight, you might notice here, fight, flight, and then there's feed. What are we feeding on? Hummus and carrot sticks? No, right? The cheeseburger chocolate axis is what? It's a source of cheap, easy, salty, greasy, carbohydrate, sugary food cheap, easy energy, so I can keep going. One of the, so, one of the things, especially if we're stressed, that we have to worry about is that your, your body's natural tendency is not to go for the fresh fruit, right? Your body's natural tendency is to go for the chocolate bar or the double-double, right? Where was the five guys? I noticed we passed one on the way here, right? And so, 
you know, you can start to see how weight could become a problem if chronic stress is an issue because then my default is to go for sugary drink and nice, nice big cheeseburger. So part of the, the training, you know, we can do for ourselves is to notice, oh, my body wants this, but, you know, I really should have the hummus and carrot stick. Um, so then you get into rapid shallow, shallow breathing and then, and then worry, you know, keeps showing up. Okay, make sense? So then you have this more advanced stage, which is called freeze, which is that the brake gets stuck on on. Right? So you have, a, you have an in, intense activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And we don't necessarily associate these kind of things with stress, but this is about kind of removal, depression, disconnection, deadness, exhaustion, right? I want to lie in bed, leave me alone, don't bother me. Low energy, the digestion's lousy, your heart rate is low, maybe your blood pressure is low. Sadness, apathy, I don't care. And then here's the area of immune system dysfunction. Okay? Now the reason why I want to talk about this in this way is that when we see these things, right, or these things, we tend to think of them as character problems. Right? What's wrong with you? They're not character problems. They're biology problems. This is, not, this is about overwhelmed biology or a mismanaged nervous system. Or it could be an organizational culture that's creating this. It's not a personal thing. Right? So how do we start to manage it? And one of the things we'll do, we'll do a little practice. Uh, how do you start to manage hyperarousal? How do you start to drop out of being hyperactivated and back into your resilient self? Okay? So would you like to practice something like this? It'll be, it'll be easy. Um, something called grounding. We have, uh, we have until 5.30. Okay, good. Okay, so this is the most basic practice you could learn. Uh, I teach it to uh, it's something I practice every day. It's, it's about, if we go back here, how do you start to expand your zone of resilience? And you can use a practice like this. And as you start to develop your skill with it, you can start to use it anywhere. So uh, for some executives I work with, they say, I do this practice if I know I'm about to go into a difficult meeting or I'm about to have a difficult phone call. You know, I know Joan's scheduled at 3 o'clock and it's 2.45. I do this beforehand, right? Um, or if you were waiting for your late or canceled airplane, you know, what are you going to do? So, okay, so find a comfortable position, step one, right? And, and it doesn't have to be this. It could be com whatever is really comfortable. So uh, we'll come back to that in a minute, yeah? <laughs> So the first step, or the second step, I call it point, which is to put your attention at an imaginary point two inches below your navel. Every martial arts teacher will tell you this is your center of gravity. Right? So what happens when you put your attention at an imaginary spot two inches below your navel? So that's point. And the second step is seat, which is to shift your attention from point to the sensation of connection between your body and the, the, the seat. And all you have to do is let your attention rest in the sensation of connection. You don't have to think anything particularly. You're just resting in connection between you and the seat. And notice what happens inside. Then you can gradually shift your attention from the seat 
to the sensation of connection between the floor and your feet. And to feel the solidity of the floor underneath your feet. And notice again what happens in your body. What happens to your breathing or to your muscles or to your heart rate? And then the next step is to imagine from the bottom of your feet roots coming down and going into the ground. And as you do that, notice what happens. And if you want, shift your attention to the place, point, seat, feet, or root that is the most accessible to you, or the easiest place for you to sense into. And just let your attention rest there. Notice what happens. hang out for a little bit more, noticing what's changed since we began. What's different? And how can you sense that? And then when you're ready, we have plenty of time, you can slowly open your eyes. And look around the room. So I'm curious to know, what did you notice? Say it again? Calmness. Calmness. So how many people noticed, oh, I actually got calmer? Most people. Sometimes it can be the case that I get calmer and then suddenly I feel more activated. Right? Um, that can happen too. So if that happens, what that means is that you know, your nervous system is not used to being calm. And so suddenly you sink down a little bit and then it's like, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm vulnerable and I need to protect myself again and, I, and, and the nervous system shoots back up. So if that happens, you're not going crazy. Right? It's just that the nervous system is so used to do, being you know, up here that uh, um, it's not comfortable there. So in that case, you know, it's probably good to really be much more conscious about finding time to for, for downtime. What other things did you notice? Breathing slowed down. Breathing slowed down. I see heads nodding. Yeah. 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 How many people noticed that? Like suddenly, wow, you could hear other things. You know, the sensory acuity is, is becomes much higher. Right. So, this particular practice: point, seat, feet, root. You can do anywhere. You can do it you know, standing in line at the grocery store while you're waiting, right? So um, just sensing into your feet. And again, as I mentioned, people, some people use this right before they have a difficult meeting, so they can walk into the meeting calm. Right? 
very strategically a very useful thing. So, so let's talk a little bit about productivity. I'm going to show five sentences. You know, I get interrupted a lot, making it hard to concentrate on what's really important. Or it's really hard for me to find downtime. Or, you know, I f always feel on. Or you know, I feel like I'm juggling this complex set of interpersonal relationships. Or, we've talked about this already, you know, sometimes the amount of information coming at me is really overwhelming. How many identify with at least two or more of these things? So how do you, you know, how do you manage that? How does this condition Im impact your productivity or your well-being or your relationships? You know, not a rhetorical question. What happens? What's the result? Yeah. Anybody? Please, yeah. Sorry, I can't hear because of fan. Takes a lot longer to do things. Yeah. Over here? Yeah. Yeah, spread spread, I spread myself too thin. Please. Less satisfaction. Yeah, less satisfaction with each activity. Relationships get strained. Please. Yeah. Beat myself up? Yeah. I can't, yeah, I can't focus on what's really important, right? Yeah. So here's this strange world we've created. Uh, when I was in college, I worked at a, 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 an electroplating factory. And what productivity was there was, productivity there was about focusing on doing one thing. I put door hinges on a hanger and put that hanger on a big machine, you know, the size of three of these rooms. And that was my job. That was my job before lunch and then after lunch, I. The, the, the door hinges would get electroplated, you know, they'd go around this giant machine and then I'd go to lunch and then after lunch here they'd come and you'd take them off and you'd, you'd take the hanger off and then you'd take these door hinges off and I had to do that every 90 seconds for eight hours a day. The genius of productivity in an in a industrial setting was based on the fact that you focused your attention to do one thing, right? And basically nobody bothered you, right? Um, I didn't, I didn't get pinged or texted or anything like that. The complexity of the relationships I had with the men that were on the line were me trying not to get in their way so they wouldn't try to figure out evil things to do to me, uh, which they did. Um, like paint the, factory, uh, paint the factory roof silver in the hot July Ohio sun. Uh, that was one of my jobs. But you know, it wasn't particularly nuanced. It was, it was pretty clear cut. Right? And at 3.30, I could go home, and I didn't think about door hinges until 6 a.m. the next day. And at Friday at 3.30, I definitely did not think about door hinges until Monday morning. Right? But in this world we've created, you know, is that true? So you know, one of the things, uh, the dean and I had a meeting earlier this afternoon and talking about how do we start, how do we help you create the tools to solve the problems that are not clear. Right? What about the problems we don't really understand well? Most of, I would bet most of your education, at least to this point, has been about solving problems that are already defined. How do you solve problems that aren't defined? Right? And so how do you evaluate that? We're living in, a, in an age where we're interrupted all the time. Right? So how do I focus? I mean, I love this thing, but you know, there are, there are downsides. Uh, how am I evaluated? At the end of the day, I could count the number of door hinges I did. Productivity was really clear. But in in your environment, how does that work? Many people, if, especially if you work in a matrixed organization, don't even know who their boss is. Right? So whose priorities do I get, or do I follow? And in a flattened hierarchy, work is highly relational. And if I have to you know, ask you to help me on my project and you've got your own stuff, right, the quality of our relationship is going to be a lot more important. And then, of course, nobody ever goes home, right? Because work follows you everywhere. 
right? There's, a, there's, no, there's no downtime. And instead of boredom of taking off door hinges, right, I would say that the dominant emotional tone of this era is anxiety, which is the thing we started out with. So how do I manage this? How do I manage a world of you know, constant ambiguity? When we think about productivity, traditionally it's focused primarily on external, right? So we get, we get new tools, maybe we rearrange the office, maybe we restructure the organization, right? Uh, and I think no one would argue, you know, here's where I start to sound like an old guy, but you know, when I was in grad school, if we needed a paper, you had to go to the library, you had to go find which volume it was in, you'd have to take it out, and then you'd cut yourself the paper and you'd bleed all over, and then you'd have to make a photocopy of it. And maybe just finding one paper took you like a half an hour. And now you get it in milliseconds, right? So nobody's gonna argue that technology didn't uh, help us become more productive, but we also know it has a, it has a downside. So that maybe instead of focusing just on the external, maybe we can focus on the internal. And how can we use our minds more effectively? So again, we'll go back to this, to this uh, diagram. So we have this idea of managing the team or managing the organization and then managing myself and then this idea of managing moments. But what does that really mean? We talked about in the first part, uh, managing the nervous system. But the second part, as we start to develop this skill, is really about managing attention. So how am I managing attention in an age of incessant distraction? My argument, the, the man I had the sincere pleasure of being my graduate advisor, uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi at the University of Chicago, uh, developed this idea called flow, flow experiences, right? Which I'm sure you know uh, were is, is this moment where you're so absorbed in something you lose sense of time and space and yourself and you feel like you're being pushed to your limit and you feel really vital and alive. That was all predicated on having focused attention. Right? Without focused attention, there was no flow. So my argument is that in a knowledge economy, to the extent that humans are the ones doing the work, that productive power is based on focused attention. Whether it's your ability to focus on the problem you're working on or the person I'm with right now, right? That's the baseline. And so, so what's attention, right? Let's consider, you know, what it looks like at the extremes, right? So we might have, this might be our experience, right? And so we know there's now a decade's worth of research that shows fragmenting your attention or splitting your attention between two or more things impacts your productivity. You make more mistakes. You take more time. You know, somebody even mentioned it. It takes a lot longer than I, you know, my stuff takes a lot longer than I want it to. So it takes a lot longer. I make more mistakes. I irritate everyone around, around me, right? So it's weakening the relationship. Why is it that uh, this has become okay to do? Even the basic insight of uh, Henry Ford and industrialism was that you know, if you had one thing to do, you became more productive. Uh, and we haven't even translated that basic insight into knowledge work. So let's say you know, she spends her day in the office like this, but she goes home and unwinds doing this. Right? And so as I mentioned, just mentioned, right? it's these intense, intensely focused attention is what leads to you know, these, this sensation of really being alive. And you can't imagine she's going to whip out her iPhone right now and like, text her boyfriend what's for dinner. Right? I mean, if you're playing a game of tennis or chess or whatever, you know, how good is it going to be if you're doing it while you're doing something else? If you think about it in that context, it, it's kind of, it becomes kind of crazy. So one of my questions is how are you using your attention? And at lunch, this became you know, one of the topics we really we spent a lot of time on. Um, simply watching how you're using attention, how you're navigating screens in your life or windows in your life. 
uh, one, one thing to look at is to see how, how is your workspace designed to either help or hinder your attention. So one, one executive I worked with uh, went back to her office space working in a job, very talented person, uh, was very frustrated in her job and didn't know why because she was good at what she did and why am I always feeling this frustration? She walks into her office and looks and notices here's her office door and right here is the office copy machine. And so every time somebody's like waiting for their copies to be done, they're sticking their head in her office. And she said, I'm interrupted two, three, four times an hour with trivia, right? With somebody just wanting to say hi to me and making chit chat. Uh -huh. And I realized I haven't been able to concentrate ever since I started this job. And I never noticed it because I didn't think about my attention. So that's the external way. The internal way is to start to see you know, when, in a moment, you're focused on this and your attention involuntarily goes to something else. Right. OK, I'm focusing on this thing I'm writing, and then suddenly, oh, why am I scrolling down on my Facebook page? Right. Or some thought involuntarily pops up and says, you know, you know I'm really curious about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And then you start to Google Frank Lloyd Wright. And then, oh, Frank Lloyd Wright, this is really interesting. Oh. Wow, uh, let's look at the Roby House. Oh, the Roby House is on the University of Chicago. Oh, let's look about the University of Chicago. Oh, let's look about, and then you know, like uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning scientists. And then uh, let's, uh, let's look about uh, Sweden. And then look at Sweden. And then you're looking at, you know, three hours later, you're looking at Swedish meatball recipes, <laughs> right? And so, and we don't even notice that it happens. You know, because it's so natural, attention suddenly shifts. And I think one reason we don't notice it happens is because our, curiosity and our pleasure are driving it. And so it becomes almost invisible, right? That my attention gets seduced off into something else. Uh, I think it was in the, in the book that I referenced earlier, Nicholas Carr's book on what the internet is doing to our brain. Show, there are studies that show that reading text on paper and reading text on a hyperlinked, a hypertexted screen is a different experience because every time your brain encounters a hyperlink, you have to make a choice of whether or not to push it. And so you're using more effort while you're reading a screen. So what I started to do was to see when was my attention getting seduced into something else that I didn't necessarily want to be doing. And, I, and I'll tell you, I'll be completely frank, that it's, I'm not like 100% successful doing this all the time. But what I become much more aware of are how articles you know, on the side of the article that you're reading are there, are designed to seduce your attention into something else, right? It'll be like a top 10 list or the three secrets of, right? Or what was the other one? The, the top five worst on-screen chemistry or uh, worst uh, on-screen relationships with the you know, lousiest chemistry, right? Or some, something like that. And it's like, oh, like, I don't even care and I'm clicking on it, right? five best cat photos of 2012, right? And they're clicking on it. And so it's, and it's like, not like, I'm not even interested. And there you go. So I started to make it a practice to watch when was my attention moving off, right? And then I started to bring it back. And it's a relentless practice. So, it's not like, okay, one day you decide you're going to be completely focused 100% whenever you're using a screen, and then it's done, right? It's just, it's, it is consistent, in, and then you have to be insistent that this is how you're going to navigate. Because it will always get seduced by something. And then two, three hours can go, and where am I? I noticed that, at least in Mac, the, uh, uh, the latest version of Office has a, has a new view option called Focus, where all you see is just your document and a black background. Um, that, that's been really useful you know, for someone like me who has no natural focus. So, does, let me, um, we could do a little exercise. So, does anybody believe that multitasking actually makes you effective? I'm just curious to know. No? 
because um, I think we've all gotten the message about this, right? So one little experiment you can try. You know, if you're bored at Thanksgiving dinner and you want something else to talk about besides what your family usually talks about, whatever that is, you could try this little exercise. Four, um, four lines on a, on a piece of paper. Write out the sentence, multitasking makes me smart. I have to say a disclaimer that this is an exercise I, I learned from my friend Rasmus Hogard in, in, uh, of the Potential Project in Copenhagen. Multitasking makes me smart. And then the numbers 1 through 25 and time yourself and how long does it take. Most people, you can do this between 30 and 40 seconds without mistakes and with little effort. Then, to make things interesting, instead of writing them out sequentially, you can alternate. So write an M, then a 1, then a U, then a 2, then an L, then a 3, and then take the time. 50 seconds to more than a minute. You feel frustrated. You make mistakes. Where am I? Um, and you start to see, even in this simple, brainless task, splitting attention is not effective. Because this flipping back and forth is, in a way, kind of stimulating and a little bit addictive, it takes time to wean yourself off of it. But uh, I, would, I would highly recommend to make the effort. So now let's step back and say a, a bigger question, a bigger picture. And uh, yeah, please, please, sure. It's a great question. So Joe's question is, is, is because we're living in an environment that's constantly you know, drawing our attention away from us, is becoming aware of that, you know, helping you to change behavior, or is it you know, becoming aware of that there's this kind of persistent struggle? And I would argue, yes, right? Uh, in, in my own case, I certain, I'm probably much more likely to stop myself if I start to go down one of the rabbit holes of a Google search that, goes to, that ends up with Swedish meatballs, right? But I wouldn't say that I'm 100% perfect at it but I'm much more vigilant about not doing it or seeing when it happens to stop. Um, but if you never see that it happens, then you're, you know, yeah. Can I yeah, please, please. You yeah, definitely, I can see it. Yeah, like my, uh, you know, there's just more words on the page or, or something. Sometimes, uh, and I don't know if this is possible, I just either do my work away from the computer right, and just do it all on paper, you know, especially if I'm writing something, or, or you know, I'm sketching out something or planning something and then come back and type it on the computer, or we just turn the internet off and then do the work that way. Which, you know, because at some point you, really, you can't, you have to take other structural efforts because I just because my you know my brain will go there anyway right and so if I just turn the thing off um, then it's then it's great yeah so the question about mindfulness practice you know we tend to think of mindfulness practice as a tool for stress reduction but you know what are the other benefits uh, that's exactly actually that anticipates the next set of slides so yeah so Here's a bigger question, and this is one of the things we talk about with the dean today, and I'll talk about tomorrow at the law school, is what, it, what does it really mean to be educated? Right? So in the modern West, we really took our cue from Descartes. And, that, and for us, uh, I would argue that largely education has been about thinking. Right? And so you know, here you're trained to think in a certain way about a certain topic. At the law school, they're trained to think in a certain way about a different topic. At Chicago, I was trained to think about stuff, about you know, the workings of the mind and, and all of that. Right? But it was always about thinking. Right? I'm developing analytical strategies or um, 
refining questions, developing uh, rhetorical strategies, whatnot. You know? But Drucker comes along and says that, well, maybe this isn't enough, that maybe there's more that we need to do in a, in a changing environment. He wrote this in 1989, in a changing environment that, is, that goes beyond or that builds on thinking. Right? And he said, you know, that Descartes said that I, I think, therefore I am, but we'll also have to say I see, therefore I am. And that we had, basic, we had primarily focused on cultivating the conceptual, but that maybe we have to spend some time cultivating also the perceptual. And the reason why is that because human behavior habituates to seeing the world in a certain way, we have to cultivate the capacity to see a changing world in order to adapt to it. And so, uh, so, you know, just thinking about an institution and, it's, and how do you adapt an institution to a changing world requires the ability to see beyond our own current set of assumptions and standards. One of the things we talked about uh, also is this notion of design thinking, which I think is amazing that you get to learn that, right? So how do I start to, how do I, how do I solve problems from zero or negative five, right, that aren't completely defined for you? It's, it requires the ability to see reality clearly so that you can innovate what's actually happening. And that, that's why he thought this was imperative. And that in the 21st century, truly educated people could see changing realities in order to adapt. Because you know, we understand, I think we all very much experience that we are living in a time of really serious, deep fundamental changes. So I like to think that maybe we have to uh, expand our definition of what rigor is. And that we've traditionally thought about rigor as, a, as an intellectual thing, maybe, right? But maybe there's also perceptual rigor. That how do I train myself to see what's happening? How do I train myself to see myself? What am I doing? Right? And then maybe we could also argue that there's emotional rigor. How do I train myself to deal with my emotional reactions? Because those get in the way of our effectiveness. So we can learn to cultivate and manage attention. Now, for Westerners, this is a kind of, seems like a strange idea. But 100 years ago, William James, the great Harvard psychologist, talked about the capacity to bring back a wandering attention over and over again was what you know, gave you uh, good judgment, character, and will. Right? And, and he thought that it was necessary for mastering yourself, and that, and that the education that provided that would be the education par, par excellence. And then in the paragraph below that, it was like, yeah, but we're too bad. There's no real practical way to do that. Right? Uh, now, 100 years before him, Adam Smith talked about cultivating the impartial spectator. So it was the ability to see yourself clearly so you could take moral action. And so these ideas have been in our culture for a long time, but they've been in other cultures even longer. Uh, this is the kind of classic Zen story of the, of the student coming to the master saying, tell me, you know, tell me profound wisdom. And the master says, oh, attention. And they're like, the student's like, yeah, you, know, you got something better than that? And it's like, well, attention, attention. And still un, you know, unplussed by that, it's like, no, g you know, give me your most profound teaching. And he says, attention, attention, attention. And so, you know, my, I think I mentioned my mother's Japanese, so I spent a lot of time in Japan. And one of the realizations I came to was that Japan is full of these methods for the Japanese. Traditionally, education started with cultivating attention. And so a strong, stable attention was the foundation for everything else. So that, and, and their, the culture is full of these traditional arts, like tea ceremony, calligraphy. My father-in-law is a master calligrapher who has an amazing attention span. Uh, archery, oops, archery, sword play, flower arrangement, all of these things were ways of cultivating attention. Maybe in our culture it's music, sports, and art are the, th are the three ways we cultivate attention. And so, as Joe referenced earlier, uh, I'm having a battery problem, I think. One way we can think about cultivating a higher quality attention is something like mindfulness. And 
and now there's 40 years of research that shows not only is it transformative medically, right, improving symptoms around psoriasis and chronic pain and fibromyalgia and cancer and all of these different things, hypertension, uh, but you have psycho behavioral benefits like decreased depression, right? So if we're talking about managing emotions, decreased depressions, anxiety, panic attack, insomnia, binge eating, ADHD, OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, substance abuse, and it helps you stop smoking. And then when we talk about the knowledge economy or knowledge workers, you have all of these enhanced cognitive capacities around attention, concentration, more, you get more creative, you solve problems more effectively, you have better memory, you become more flexible cognitively, right? you're more ethical in your decision making, and you see reality with less distortion. So again, kind of perceptual rigor. Right? How do I know I'm seeing things clearly? In fact, right before I came here, I had a had an email exchange, friendly email exchange with, uh, the, with the school back home that we had, I had interpreted a document this way and, and my colleague had interpreted the same document in the completely opposite way. And so we had to appeal to the higher authority of saying, okay, what's the reality? You know, are, you know who's, what's actually going on? Because I see this X and, and you know, they see this Y and so it turns out that um, you know, one of us was not right. And so, and it was simply because we perceived the situation differently. And we could have gotten into a big argument and all this stuff, and I'm right and you're right, and blah, 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 but I said, okay, you know, it, it, let's just see what's, what's the right interpretation here. So how can we start to uh, this is the closing line, but how do we start to use attention to, to transform results? And so if I'm talking to an, uh, an audience for a short time, this is how we start to talk about mindfulness and mindfulness in action. We think that there's kind of two kinds of results. This is very simplistic, right? So what, what, would you, what would you think they are? Two kinds of results. Basic category. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, sure. I hadn't thought of that as the answer, but I love that, but no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. The results you want and the results you don't want. Right? So, so let's make an analysis of where results come from. We start with a result, right? What the, result is the, the result comes from some action we take. The action we take is derived from the choices that we perceive. And our perception is defined by what we're aware of. And what we're aware of is informed by where we're putting our attention or where we're putting our energy. And that is informed by what we want, our intention. So what I'm wanting informs what I'm looking for or where I'm putting my energy. That informs what makes up my world, right? The thoughts, the behavior, the beliefs, emotions, judgments, preconceived notions, expectations, and that influences the choices I make, right? People are in the midst of a strong emotional reaction have a limited amount of choices, right? If I'm angry, it's pretty easy to figure out what are the th things I might do, right? And that influences my action and that brings about a result. So we start to, we can do this kind of, uh, inquiry, right? What's my goal? Where's my focus and energy? What do I know? Or what do I feel? What do I assume? What are my options? Right? What do I do? And, you know, what are the results I'm receiving? And are these the results I want? So, right? So, makes sense? Is it clear? So you can do this kind of analysis to see, I keep getting a result I don't want, and then you know, is there somewhere on this chain that's breaking down? Am I even really clear about what I want? Might be one thing. We'll go through a couple of case studies, okay? So, oops, sorry, this is... So, my argument is if we cultivate attention, right, we def create rigorous perception, we're able, better able to see this chain in action. So 
we talk about what's distracting your attention, let me give you a case study of uh, one, one of my students who was CIO of a $2 billion uh, food company. We talk about this issue of attention and productivity. And he goes into the office, they have a weekly meeting, a uh, 90 minute meeting every, uh, every Monday. And he's decided that, he noticed that in this weekly meeting, everybody's looking at their, their device. And I'm really impressed, by the way, you're not looking at your devices. That's, that's, a, that's I'm kind of moved by that, actually. So he realized that there were, they were looking at their devices and they weren't in their meetings, right? And so he stood out, in the next meeting, he stood out in the, door, in the hallway with a cardboard box, and he said, please put your device in the box before you come into the meeting. And he collected all these blackberries, and he put the, he put the box in the corner. And he said, you know, I'm looking around this table at everybody, and it was like being in a rehab ward. Like everybody's twitching, and they're irritable, and they're snapping at each other, and this box is humming and buzzing and jumping in the corner. Um, and people resented me, but I kept it up. And the next week I did the same thing, and the week after that I did the same thing, and the week after that I did the same thing. And much to our surprise, that 90-minute meeting became a 60-minute meeting. And we had, he said, we had conversations about the problem the organizations were facing, and we solved them. And going back to your comment, he said, at the end of it, we felt satisfied because we had actually dealt with things. And we didn't have to schedule another meeting to have a meeting to talk about the topic we were supposed to have the meeting for because everyone else was not in the meeting. And so he implemented this device-free policy in his calendar. So if you came to meet him, he got a little table that he set out away from his desk. And if you came to meet him, he would come out from behind his desk and come sit, at you, sit with you at this little table. And you'd have a little 10-minute dialogue. And he would focus in, on what you needed to do. And then the dialogue would be done. And he'd get up and he'd go back to work. And he'd ask you to leave your device at your office. And so by implementing just that simple thing, device-free policy, he, at the end of six weeks, had two to three discovered discretionary hours a day. Right? So for a C-suite level executive, that's conservatively 40 hours a month, simply by paying attention to what he was doing. This was in contrast to another executive I worked with who was a multitasking madman who was writing an, art, writing an email to, a, to his HR colleague about a, an employee they needed to fire and accidentally send it to the employee. Right. So that was a painful moment. How do you start to take care of your attention? So for him, it was right, looking at what was his goal? What did they want from this meeting? And where was their focus and energy? Uh, what they realized, what he realized was their focus and energy was totally scattered. And his awareness was that people were not here. They were somewhere else. They were tending to whatever thing that was going on in their Blackberry. And he decided his options were to help people focus their attention. He took, took the little devices away, and they had a better resolve. And their relationships were better. Let me talk about one more, and then we can go into questions. This is the case, I call this the case of the annoying associate. OK, so imagine this picture. Uh, this was one of the leadership fellows I work with. She was the head of a nonprofit organization. She has uh, a colleague they hired to perform a function in the organization, and that that colleague stands in her doorway and talks incessantly. The, the fellow, the person I was working with, then does this. The associate is still there talking. So, got the picture? So what happens is the, the CEO or the organization, nonprofit organization, gets irritated. Um, she gets angry. And she, you know, she's avoiding this person. And the whole thing you know, keeps going. That's their relationship. This person has been working for the organization for a year. And she's really angry. 
And so I said, well, okay, let's talk about this. You know, I can see you're really angry, you're really frustrated with this person, and uh, let's switch the camera lens around. When in your hiring of her did you set forth the expectations of what success was for her in this, in this organization? Quiet, quiet, quiet. And then she says, oh, I, I, I haven't. I go, okay. So if you, you know, flip the camera around and put yourself in her position, what do you think she's trying to do there standing in your doorway? Connect with me. And what are you doing? Avoiding her? Right? And by this time, you know, tears are coming down her face because she's realized that she has created and perpetuated the entire problem. Right? So here's this person, hired to do a job, never given any guidelines of what success is. Right? And when she comes to try to get that, right, her, now her way of doing it may not be so effective for this particular boss, but the boss gets caught up in an emotional reaction. Right? And so, uh, so you know, her intention at that moment becomes avoiding this person. Right? I turn away. Right? And so I get caught up in my, you know, my, me, the boss, gets caught up in my avoidant emotional reaction. I get absorbed in the disliking of this person. I pretend she's not there. And you know, I, I do this little passive aggressive maneuver and the whole, the whole relationship keeps persisting. And it was simply because she didn't see beyond her own emotional reaction. Right? So in a way, it's, again, it come, comes back to this idea of emotional rigor. Right? She, she got caught up in it. And she couldn't see past what was this person actually wanting. So, uh, so this are, these are ways you can use mindfulness in action. Right? So she went back and repaired the relationship. She said, you know, realize. I've created all this for you, and I've created the problem. You must be frustrated, and I was frustrated, but really it's all on me, so let's talk. All right. um, we have about 10 minutes left, so the, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you. you know, what, what are questions you might have, or comments, or experience you'd like to share, or anything like that? Was this useful? Yeah, you know? right. Sure. Of all the benefits. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was mindfulness. Now there's so many papers on mindfulness, it's really hard to keep track of, of what's actually going on because it's, it's gone like that. Yeah. There's research showing that mindfulness actually changes the brain. Which... Yeah, right. Yeah, that was a slide we could show, but there, yeah, there are uh, studies now that show even after eight weeks it changes the structure and function of, of brain activation in many, many different ways. Right? Decreasing emotional reactivity, increasing the capacity to pay attention, um, all kinds of stuff. Please. Yeah, so the question is, you know, what, what do I do when everyone else around me is, is uh, you know, running around? Right? One, well, that's where friends are really important, I would say, you know, and you rope them in. Uh, so in, for me, say in school, I made a deal with my, a friend of mine that we would do weight training together. Um, so I didn't have to do it by myself. The, um, I, I have a good friend who built his own company, and he said, you know, one of the things that saved me was that every Sunday night, I get together with a group of my buddies, and we hang out, and we talk about what's going on. And that's, and that's like non-negotiable. So. You know, they took active, made active effort to create the structure. And so, you know, how can you do that in your own life? My wife and I go for a walk every night at 9 o'clock for an hour. Um, you know, I have colleagues that, you know, I'm, I'm not a morning person, so they do it in the morning. Um, but, yeah. You know, it's, I think it's also realizing you, we actually have more choice than, than, I think we realized at some point too that you know you can always take five minutes to do grounding. You know that one thing I didn't mention. You know one thing I would suggest is through your day, just stop for a minute. You don't even have to do it for five minutes, just a minute, and let your attention sink back down into 
where you are. And even something simple like that can be useful. Yeah, please. When you've been doing these things, uh, being with friends, resting, how do you cope with the fear that you fall in the heart? Yeah, I recognize that it's a fear. You know, that that's, you know, your point is so well taken because when, when uh, we first start learning uh, meditation practice in class, the first three weeks are, I'm wasting my time. I've got so much to do. You know, this is, you know, this is, a, this is not effective use of my energy. But at week four, people start to, realize, start to look forward to it. Like, wow, this is, this is I mean, the, the first time I taught the class, uh, a woman who was uh, an immigrant from China who worked for a company started as, her, as their executive assistant. And then she became vice president five years later, 10 years later. And she said, you know, I really hated this practice that you were making us do as our homework. And for the first week, I really resented you because I had so many things to do. She was a single parent. She had a young son. And, uh, and then, but I kept doing it because it was my homework. And so week two went by and week three went by and I still hated it. And then week four, I started to notice I was looking forward to it. And then week five, I, I really got into it. And then by week six, I realized that was the only time I had in my life for myself. And, you know, and, the, and, the, and she, tears were running down her face. And even though it was like midnight, I would do it because that was the time I could connect with me. But I think it's important to create some kind of structure that helps because, it, because you know, because there are so many dissipating forces. Yeah. Other comments, questions? 5.30? Oh, yeah, we should go. So anyway, I uh, appreciate it. So on that note, uh, I think it's a great place to stop. Thank you, Jeremy.